podcast. Uh, I've uh, spoken about that podcast a number of times on the show. He's also been writing for the Post Millennial. He also has a terrific YouTube channel, which he's going to tell you all about. David, uh, how can people access your content on Google, on uh, YouTube? Rather, Let's go to uh, Creighton's Right on YouTube. And the show is Stand on Guard. But Creighton's Right, no apostrophe. You can find me on YouTube, and I'm there just about every day now. Yep. Yeah. Um, doing the good fight. Fighting the good fight. Let's start off with this uh, intro to a story on CTV. This was posted by Rowan the Stallion. CTV News doing its part to contribute to an extreme uptick in anti-Semitism watches the anchor over there deliberately misrepresents an entirely peaceful rally for the Jewish people as a rally for support. But it wasn't just that. Let's listen. In Ottawa, thousands of Jewish Canadians rallied on Parliament Hill in support of the war, while inside Parliament, Palestinian Canadians made a plea for help. Here's CTV's Judy Trent. Yeah, so here you are, you, those warlike Jews and Israeli supporters, Israel supporters, and those poor Palestinians begging for help. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. I, I, they weren't begging for help on October the 7th when they were slaughtering uh, 12 or 1,300 people in Gaza at a music festival, uh, David. I, does that smell to you a little bit? Well, I noticed that the, the, the Israeli supporters are outside, the Palestinian supporters are inside. <laughs> inside. <laughs> I, I've seen a double standard towards these protests because there have been so many of these, and I don't necessarily want to say they're Palestinian supporters, but they're Antifa, they're extremists, they're Islamists, they are absolutely actually occupying MPs offices and they're taking over and, and there's been no arrests and that there's been no even disagreement in the media about this. And I, and I don't know if the people yesterday in front of Parliament Hill, I wasn't able to be there large because of the weather out here, but I don't know if those people were supporting the war as, so, as much as they were supporting Jews around the world and opposing anti-Semitism and supporting Israel in the way they can, because it's the way they phrase it. They're trying to in, in, intimate that this pro-Israel rally is a pro-war rally, and I, and I really dislike the, the double standard that has grown up around these protests. But I, as I said from the beginning, I want this war over, and I want this stupid street fighting to end because nobody's benefiting except identity politics and Justin Trudeau. And I'm sick of this. It's, it's the anti-Semitism, the cries of Islamophobia, I want religious unity in this country so we can focus on the issues that really matter, such as going after gender ideology, <laughs> such as stopping the LGBT yeah. agenda, yeah. stopping stopping pride season. I, I want to return to that. I, I'm sick of these damn protests in the streets, and I'm sick about arguing about a foreign war. Yeah, I mean, when you consider uh, some of the vile rhetoric that we've been hearing in these uh, pro-Palestinian, I want to say pro-Hamas, protests in toronto uh it, it doesn't ring true when uh, ctv portrays these helpless palestinians uh begging the government for help while you've got these warmongering israelis outside um i mean i've heard audio from that rally i wasn't there either but it sounds like there was a lot more singing and dancing than there was demanding for blood so um you know i don't know are they that uh you know unaware of what they're doing over there these days. I worked at CTV for years and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed for those people right now, but let's talk about your, uh, your post earlier about uh, the assisted suicide program. Um, you said assisted suicide capital of the world. Canada is deliberately hiding numbers of people dying from made. That's the name of the program. Euthanasia program. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I just got wind of this yesterday, and I've, I've, uh, I'm asking Statistics Canada today whether or not they're fudging the numbers from here on forth or if they've been fudging the numbers up till now. Because what StatsCan is saying in their post on X is that they're no longer or they have no longer been reporting 
medical assistance in suicide deaths as suicides. They're reporting them with any medical condition connected with these people asking for suicide. So it's kind of the reverse of what happened dur during the COVID-19 pandemic. You went to a hospital in a car crash, you had any sign of COVID, died of COVID. We had that sort of nonsense going on with COVID. Everybody was dying of COVID. Didn't matter if you had a heart attack, died of cancer or whatever. Now with the medical assistance and dying program, they're saying you died of anything but assisted suicide. If you, if you went there because you were depressed, if you went there because you were impoverished, if you went there because you were dying of cancer, well, that's the reason you died. It's not because a doctor assisted you in killing yourself. Now, this is just downright mendacious. These are lying numbers. At least the government of Canada seems to have enough moxie to admit they're lying about the numbers and they put them on their website. But that doesn't make it acceptable. I want to know, have they been lying about the numbers? In 2022, we had 13,200 people die of medical assistance and die of euthanasia in Canada. The prior year, 10,000. The numbers are not up for this year because it's not over yet. But it's certainly going to be something like 15,000, the way things are going. It's escalating every year. That means over 35,000 people have died from euthanasia in Canada. My question is, are they fudging the numbers in the past? Are these numbers not accurate? Because they've said, certainly going forward, they're going to be fudging the numbers. They're not going to be telling us how many people are actually dying of the MAID program in Canada. Sure, I'm sure the, the Trudeau government doesn't want Canadians to know that Canada is the medical assisted suicide capital of the world. That people are literally flying to Canada to die that this is the place where you can commit suicide with the assistance of a doctor, and it's all legal. And the eligibility requirements, as the government has the, uh, the nerve to frame it, is expanding every year. As of April, mental health will be part of the criteria. And mental health, the definition of that is expanding to include drug addicts, alcoholics, anybody who might be deemed not to be quite all there. And this is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Yeah, and the government sees uh, nothing wrong with it by the looks of it because they appear to be, to your point, expanding the program. I know somebody who may qualify due to a gambling addiction. And um, I mean, you really have to shake your head. I mean, at some point, it begins to look like the government would rather have you die than to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on your care and your treatment under whatever disease you suffer from. Um, there was this post by Wiretap Media, the expansion of MAID, this program for people suffering from mental illness, is closely aligned with the Nazi eugenics program, and it's become hard to believe that Carolyn Bennett wasn't saying the quiet part out loud. Here's a minister, uh, one of the Trudeau insiders here. What did she have to say? Let's listen. Totally irresponsible for the leader of the opposition to misrepresent what this means. All of the assessors and providers for me are purposely trained to eliminate people that are suicidal. Um, well, you could take that two, <laughs> two ways. <laughs> Eliminating people who are suicidal, meaning why, give them a pill? Uh, put them under it so they never wake up again. I mean, eliminate people that are suicidal are purposely trained to eliminate people that are suicidal. I don't know if that's a poor choice of words there, but it sounds like she wanted to eliminate people who are suicidal, meaning get yeah, rid of them because they're costing us money. Yeah, you know, she could have said liquidate, and that's exactly what. It's all about. But I. And what else bothers me is that, yes, when you expand it to include drug addicts and people with addiction, it's eugenics. It's not just euthanasia. It's eugenics. You're getting rid of people that you don't think are just quite right for your society. Let's get rid of these people. They, they're a little bit of an embarrassment. Get rid of them. And I'm sure half of them really don't want to commit suicide. So this, this becomes increasingly problematic. But what really bothers me about fudging the numbers and pretending people aren't dying of assisted suicide, but something else. That's exactly what Nazi Germany did with their euthanasia program. 
They would come and pick you up in the middle of the night if you had any kind of physical deformity that could be passed on genetically. If you had any kind of mental issues that could have been passed on genetically, you were eligible for Nazi euthanasia. They'd come and pick you up, take you to the hospital, and you would die. The family members would be informed that their sister, father, husband, brother, whomever, had died not of euthanasia, not of a lethal injection, but of cancer, influenza, pneumonia, you name it, anything but euthanasia, because Nazi Germany covered it up, and they fudged their numbers too. They never went out publicly and said, oh, we, we, 700,000 people so far have died of our euthanasia program. No, they would tell people they died of everything else. And this, to me, just smacks of Nazism, of fascism, of why this government is way off the rails. Yeah, uh, the fact that they would lie about something like that, that is very troubling. It, it suggests to me that the numbers are so off the chart that they're embarrassed. That They are embarrassed by the numbers of people that they've had to put to death. And um, they think it's going to alarm people. I mean, on, on this very show, I said, look, these guys are getting to the point where uh, they'll kill anybody with so much as a hangnail or maybe having a bad hair day. Uh, is any excuse to get rid of people that... Uh, you know, may not vote for them or or they just don't want around. And so they're embarrassed by it. And so they're fudging the numbers, to your point. They're hiding the numbers from the people and they're doing it in the most cynical way possible. So if you have somebody, for instance, who's depressed, well, he somehow died of depression or some other related uh, ailment, not suicide, not state-sponsored death, which is exactly what we have in this country. And uh, it's sad. It's a sad statement uh, that so many people are willing to die or you know, would rather die than to continue living, not only under their own personal circumstances, but in, in Canada. I think Canada is a depressing place to be these days. I'm not there right now, but I, I pay a lot of attention about what's going on there. It's, it's still my home. And um, it doesn't surprise me whatsoever that a lot of people have been pushed to the very brink through economic means. Even the Guardian, the left-wing Guardian in the UK pointed that out. Are people being pushed to uh, choosing suicide uh, because of health reasons or because of, um, you know, poverty? Because of the state of uh, Canada these days. You know, can't afford a home. You know, rent uh, is off the charts. Food prices are high. You know, taxes are so high that you end up spending too much of your income servicing government than you do paying for things like time off or, you know, a vacation, which might give people, you know, a boost. And so, you know, I think you can make the case that the state of Canada these days is pushing people to the brink of saying, uh, you know what, I don't want to be here anymore and I, I can't really afford to leave. So maybe I just want to check out and government seems to be only too happy to say, oh, you're depressed. Don't worry. We can make that go away. Last word to you, my friend. Every day in, in question period, the government is asked, quizzed about why the economy is so bad. And all the Trudeau cabinet can say, so we have the lowest inflation amongst all G7 nations. I think that's bunk. I don't, I don't buy it. I think it's, it's absolute trash. I don't believe the inflation rate anymore that we're getting officially from the government, from the sources. I think it's a lot higher. Anybody who has to shop and live knows it's a lot higher than 3.1%. I think that's absolute garbage. But I think Canada is becoming a death cult. And I think it's becoming a place where people come to commit suicide. We have abortion on demand till the very last minute. We have no abortion law. We have a country that is on the verge of complete economic collapse, and we have a government that just wants to talk about climate change. And I wrote extensively over the last couple of days about this farce of a climate summit in Dubai, and I just said, do these people not have any sense of the ironic? Do they have no sense of the surreal that they would go to Dubai in the middle of a desert to have a climate change conference where they have to pump the air conditioning on 24 hours a day to keep people cool, where people fly in on private jets and they just increase their carbon footprint astronomically. 
so they can go and wine and dine and get drunk every night and, and yet still virtue signal throughout the day. This is so outrageous. This is so bad. Thank God yesterday, I don't know if you saw it, but we had one of the organizers of this event stand up and say, this, the science is not behind your absurd contention that we have to eliminate fossil fuels by 2030. And he just totally put this conference on its edge, totally undermined it, totally destroyed it. And he doubled down on his words the following day. So these, these hypocrites who wine and dine themselves and say everybody else has to sacrifice, everybody else has to be impoverished for the god of climate change are being shamed internationally right now. In front of the whole world, they can see what hypocrites these people are, how shameless these elites are, but they are finally being shamed. Wow, that's powerful stuff. Can you hang in for another segment or do you have to run? No, I don't have to run. I I, I gotta ask you more about this stuff. And we'll be back with more on News Talk Saga 960 and the Mark Petrani Show after this. You were listening to the Mark Petroni radio program, heard exclusively on News Talk Saga 960. David Traden joining us on Saga 960 on this Tuesday edition of the Mark Petroni show. And by the way, uh, next starting next week, I'm going to be doing this show in the morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. And uh, so I hope you're an early riser there, David, because we're, oh, yeah, yeah. we're going to need you to... Right. As <laughs> it come on every now and again, I want to bring as many of our guests, even those who prefer to sleep in like me, uh, to take part in that morning show. So I know people love having you on. And uh, anyway, uh, it'll be fun if you can if you can take part in the morning show. No problem. Let, let's talk about that because it was interesting. Tucker Carlson had an interview with writer uh, uh, Michael Schellenberger who basically said, yeah, the pillars of civilization, including cheap energy, are all under assault. And to your point in the previous segment, uh, that was admitted to at, this, at the summit, summit itself by, of all people, uh, Sultan Al-Jaber. M- mind you, we are talking about somebody who probably makes a good chunk of his cash from the oil sector in, in one way or, or, or not. But this is at the COP28 climate summit, where, of course, many people taking part, flew there on, on their jets, on their own private jets. People like John Kerry and people like uh, King Charles, the very rich elites. And Schellenberger says, you know, these people aren't even pretending to care about the working class. They're not even pretending to care about those who are not part of their little club. And um, getting back to that quote by Sultan al Jaber, there is no science out there or no scenario out there that says the phase out of fossil fuel is what's going to achieve a 1.5 uh, Celsius, I guess, uh, increase in uh, in warming, warning that their fossil fuel policies would take the world back to caves. Well, I'm starting to wonder if some of these elites want to push us into caves. I mean, they under they must understand. They can't be that stupid to understand. That if you take away coal, you take away natural gas, you take away nuclear energy and force people to rely on wind and solar, a lot of people are going to die because those sources of energy are simply not reliable enough to ensure that we can stay home and warm in a place like Canada, the coldest nation on Earth. Uh, what do you make yeah, of this? When I, when I was listening to these words of the salt in Algevere, I said, finally, somebody's got the guts to talk the truth at one of these farcical cop conferences, these conference of partners that they have every year, where all of these hypocrites get together and talk about how you and I are going to sacrifice, how you and I are going to get poorer so they can continue to jet set around the world, wine and dine each other, and have a great time talking about this issue and virtue signaling all during the day. And I said, thank God for this Sultan who says, this is BS. We're not going to reduce the temperature by 1.5 Celsius, which which is their big mark that they have to meet or else it's going to be global catastrophe if we don't reduce the temperature by 1.5 degrees or it doesn't increase by 1.5 degrees by by 2030 or by 2050 and and this is all nonsense because the science is not there 
And, you know, as I, as I said, this whole conference has been so unseemly. All of these elites go to the desert so they can sit in air-conditioned rooms for days on end, and they can drink all night in air-conditioned suites. There's actually a, a mountain of snow in Dubai that is artificially kept cold, once again, through air conditioning. These people all arrive there in private jet because of security reasons. They are burning a huge carbon footprint in the process of just attending this conference, and they seem nothing. They see nothing hypocritical about this. So, thank God, somebody at the conference said this is all nonsense. What are we here for? Why are we discussing this? And I saw an interview with the former Irish Prime Minister talking to this Sultan, and she was lecturing him on how he better get out there front and center and say this is an emergency. This is urgent. You'd better act now, folks, or else it's all over. And he just dismissed her. And he just said, you don't have the science to make this contention. And I'm not going to go out there and say this. And she looked increasingly, increasingly angry that this, that this stupid Arab couldn't get it. He just wasn't going to play the game. And this is the, in, the, in, the inherent racism and the inherent absolute contempt that these elites have for everybody outside their little circle. Because these globalist elites from North America and Europe want to impose their values, they want to impose their agenda on the rest of the world, and they had better damn well like it. Yeah. And the developed world has made up their mind what it's going to do, and the underdeveloped world or the undeveloped world had better take it and like it. And they better stay poor because we're fighting for climate change here, folks, and that's all that matters. And it is interesting. I want to hear a little bit of Schellenberg's interview or Tucker Carlson's interview with Schellenberg because uh, he says, look, the mask is completely off now. You've got uh, half-demented 80-year-olds uh, yelling about things that they don't understand. I'm, I'm talking to you there, John Kerry. And um, they don't care whether you agree with it or not. You're going along with what they say. They're increasingly um, hyperventilating about climate but it's really about control. Let's listen. There's so many interesting threads here. I mean, one is it that the rest of the world is ignoring it and they pay lip service to it and they're happy to sign treaties that they ignore or that have carve outs for their behavior. But it really is an Anglosphere thing. It's a, it's, it's a Western religion. It's only the United States, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia, who really believe in Germany, maybe really believe this nonsense. And China and India are like, you know, we've got a billion people here. We have to feed them. They don't care. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's, there's a financial element here, obviously, too, where the largest donor to the Democratic Party, George Soros, but also Michael Bloomberg and a whole set of other oligarchs have a strong interest in keeping energy scarce. I think that's what is a big driver of this. Yes. That's why they want to shut down nuclear plants, coal plants. They want to stifle natural gas production and they want us to use weather dependent energy dilute primitive sources of energy, so-called renewables that are actually anything other than renewable. And these are technologies that require three to 900 times more land than natural gas or nuclear plants. And that, that keep energy expensive and scarce so that they can control the energy markets around the world. And so it's really all three of these things. It's sort of a grotesque display of anti-human power, of elitist power, it's also a religion. You know, these guys actually think of themselves as saving the planet, but it's also it's just a grift. It's a scam in order to keep energy supplies, energy which should be abundant. I mean, natural gas and nuclear are, uh, you know, basically infinite sources of energy and trying to keep us scarce and uh, keep energy scarce and dependent so that they can exercise greater control over the population. Wow. I mean, that nailed it for me. The fact that it's a gigantic grift, which... You know, many of us already figured that part out. But if you're heavily invested in the oil production in other countries, dictatorships, for instance, uh, you know, the uh, Arab countries, well, you want to stifle energy production in places like the United States. And you can manipulate, you can use their system of government, their openness, and maybe the naivete of a lot of people on the left in particular to force them push them into modes of energy which are impractical, way too expensive, and will never fulfill the needs of the people. And through that, you're collapsing the economies over there, and you're bringing the people under the boot of the state. I mean, they are some 
incredibly evil people in this world, and they are profiting. This is, this is a perfect example of disaster capitalism, David. This is what I've spoken about when you've got a small group of elites who have essentially shorted the Western democracies and intend to profit mightily from the collapse of Western democracies. Isn't that really what, what's going on here? That's all that's going on here, because as uh, Schellenberg said several times, this is a religion. Climate change is a religion. Fighting climate change is a religion. These people are disciples of a religion, and they really believe that this is world-changing. But it's world-changing for them, because what it's all about is controlling you and, and I and everybody who is beating their brains out right now, trying to make a living, trying to make ends meet. I miss all of the taxes and all of the sacrifice for this illusionary goal of fighting climate change. And it's interesting to me, when you see the vocabulary, when you see the talking points, it's identical. Whether it's Canada, whether it's Ireland, whether it's Germany, whether it's the UK, they're all saying the same thing. They're all reading the same talking points. They're all reading the same script. So where is it coming from? Who's writing the script? Well, obviously, it's the globalists. Obviously, it's the World Economic Forum. That's where they go every year for their marching orders. That's where people like Trudeau are keynote speakers. And that's, that's why they all talk the same way. They have the same objective. It's control. And it, they want us to be well-ordered citizens of a global community. And, the, and as they keep saying, we won't own a house. We won't own a car but we're going to love it. And of course, the last part of that's a lie because we're, we're, we're marching towards global enslavement and we're, we're, we're hearing a tune that's being played by one source and it's being picked up by all of these democratic countries and they're taking us in the same direction. And I'm frankly, I am sick of it because it is difficult in Canada to make a living anymore. You really have to be making $200,000 a year as a family to make ends meet in the way that 100000 did five years ago. It is absolutely devastating what taxation and the cost of just everyday life is in Canada. And I know I'm not talking to, to people who don't know this. I, I went out last week and I tried to get a Subway sandwich for two more than thirty dollars. That's just one example. And when I talk wow. about when I, when I talk about this stuff on my broadcast, I get comments you wouldn't believe from people who say, Yes, why don't we hear that in question period? The real cost of living. Stop telling us that we're number one in the G seven because that, that's not going to pay the mortgage. That's not going to that's not going to pay my rent. That's not going to meet the cost of my grocery bill this week. Rhetoric like that is meaningless. Well, they do discuss something. I mean, the questions are asked, uh, whether or not there's a good answer or not, there isn't. Uh, the government seems to be touting things that aren't even true, you know, suggesting that they are pushing for more affordability. But it, it's just words, to your point. It doesn't translate into any concrete action because they're too busy imposing financial misery on people in order to save the planet. I mean, you can't push economic misery on people through higher taxes, hoping to push them into doing things or not doing things that you don't want them to do. And then on the other hand, say, wow, we're going to make life more affordable to you. It doesn't work. You know, it's, it's two contradictory statements because they are literally making your life more miserable in order to, quote unquote, save the planet. Last word to you, my friend. Well, I would encourage people to watch uh, Pierre Polyev's mini documentary on housing. And I, I'm not here to be a shill for the Conservative Party of Canada. I'm not in their pocket. I will, I will congratulate Pierre and the Conservatives when they do, do good things. And they've done a good thing with this, with this documentary because it demonstrates what housing has become in Canada. And it's called Housing Hell. I did a story on it in yesterday's Post Millennial. Because I completely agree. The yeah, Trudeau yeah. liberal has put the price of homes and apartments so far out of reach that we're creating a permanent subclass of people living on the streets. And in the winter in Canada, that's lethal. 
And yeah. that is completely unacceptable. I encourage people to watch that and to stop. If you're worried about climate change, stop worrying about climate change. It's, it's non-existent, and it really isn't anything to worry about. Start worrying about the cost of living. Start worrying about the cost of a mortgage. Start worrying about the cost of rent. Start worrying about the cost of groceries. That's something real. And that's something Canadians need to worry about. And with a, the latest poll saying 72% of Canadians want Justin Trudeau out of there, not only as prime minister, but liberal leader, I think that message is finally sinking in. Well, I hope so. He needs to walk, uh, take that walk in the snow. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Always a great pleasure. Same here, Mark. Always a pleasure. David Craden. Let's take a break. Back with more on New Stock Saga 960, the Mark Petrona show after this. Hi, this is David Creighton from Creighton's Right and Stand on Guard. Join the resistance, resolve to resist. Become a member of this station. I've been practicing journalism in one form or another for over 30 years. I've worked in print, radio, and television for a lot of prestigious publications and media outlets. I was an Armed Forces Public Affairs Officer. I worked in Parliament Hill. I know how Ottawa works. I know how corrupt federal government can be. But you can play a part in opposing Justin Trudeau's government and Justin Trudeau's plans for Canada. You can become a part of the Creighton's Right Resistance. Now, I urge you today, please support this station in any way you can. Ring that bell, subscribe, because that ensures you're at least going to continue to be able to watch these episodes. You'll beat the algorithm. But more importantly, I need your financial support. I hate to ask, but that's what I'm doing. I made a decision to pursue independent media because I believed it was the best possible route for me to take as a journalist and as a concerned citizen of Canada. So you can become a part of that. And at only $5, you can become a part of that on YouTube, on Substack, and with Buy Me A Copy, a one-time donation. But I need your support. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. If you've already done that, if you're already supporting the station, thank you. But if you haven't, make that decision today 